Darling in the Franks, where even the trademarked beach episode gives you a ton to analyze. This is a very standard trend in anime after the big climactic episode. After everything has been elevated, you have to have an episode to reel it on back, give the audience time to recuperate, and prepare for the next arc. Hello everybody, I am Phenom Sage, and welcome back to another Darling in the Franks episode review. Today we are going to be talking about episode 7, Shooting Star Moratorium. And I had to look it up, but moratorium actually means a temporary prohibition of activity, or a ban on activity, and while that does fit the nature of this episode, that word, a ban, or a prohibition, gives an entirely new meaning and tone to the events that took place in this episode, instead of a fun break, moment of respite, vacation, that word makes it seem as if we're being prevented from doing anything for the time being. I don't know, I felt like that was an interesting distinction in the title, but let's get into this review. All beach episode memes aside, I was walking into this episode with lowered expectations after seeing the preview, because I was getting that sense of filler or a break episode until we get back into the meat of the series. And I don't know if it was because my expectations were set low, but I actually really ended up enjoying this episode a lot. And not purely because, oh, it's an entertaining episode, we actually got a lot of substance in this episode. I would say we got more substance in this episode than fan service. And I know a lot of people will probably dislike or hate this episode due to the fact that we never really ended up getting those answers that everybody wanted to the questions posed last episode. We didn't end up finding what the nature of Hero's disease was, but I will give them the benefit of the doubt and say that I feel like those answers are still coming, since during the episode they do allude to more about his condition and his partnership with Zero Two. But no, instead of getting the answers to those questions, this episode focuses a lot on planting these character seeds, establishing their relationships and dynamics with other characters, and also getting a lot of work world building, and pivotal questions and mysteries posed that haven't really been addressed up to this point. And I want to start with the character seeds first and then get into the world building, just because despite there being so much world building, I feel like the characters were the forefront of this episode. And to begin with the characters, I want to talk about this overarching theme of the ignorance of love and attraction that our group exemplifies during this episode. A lot of people have brought this up throughout the series about how a lot of these concepts and euphemisms that we point out as an audience are lost on our group outside of Zero Two. They have no idea what any of this means or what their feelings are. And for one, this distinguishes Zero Two as someone who has lived life completely differently from our pilots, surrounded in a completely different atmosphere where she has knowledge of these things that our group doesn't. But more importantly than that, through this ignorance and these concepts, the show is clearly setting this up as something that will be relevant in all of these pilots' lives. And of course, like I said, that is most prominently shown through the budding relationships and dynamics seen in this episode. So why don't we begin focusing on those? Probably the most interesting one to me shown here is the relationship and partnership that has begun forming between Mitsuru and Kokoro. Now there has been very slight foreshadowing to this relationship in the previous episodes, specifically when Kokoro finds Mitsuru taking those pills in the room, worrying about his well-being. It was a very subtle scene and I didn't really make much of it in terms of their relationship and what it meant, but in this episode it is clear as day that the series is setting up Mitsuru and Kokoro as a really interesting dynamic that will come into play later. The way that Mitsuru talks to her and cares about her well-being as well is unlike any way we've seen him refer to anyone else up to this point. The question is how will this come into play in the future? Will Kokoro eventually just end up leaving Futoshi to pilot with Mitsuru? Or or will something else happen? Are we seeing some Futoshi death flags planted here. And something that even further reinforces this, this was shown to me on the Discord and it blew my mind. In the opening, we see the character portraits pop up on screen, and you would initially dismiss this as, oh, it's just the character portraits, but I'm putting up a picture on the screen right now that hints at the budding relationship that Mitsuru and Kokoro share. Mitsuru and Ikuno do not care about each other whatsoever, and while Futoshi loves Kokoro, it's clear that Kokoro is looking for something more. 
and I want to tie this directly to the book that Kokoro finds in the abandoned city during the second half. Kokoro wanders into a building that essentially, I assume it's some kind of nursery, and she finds a book called Your First Childbirth, a book for mothers that help them with raising a child. And this is fascinating because this will also likely be huge foreshadowing to events to come. Will we actually see sex and childbirth explored in this series? A lot of people dismiss the metaphors as just a shallow way of exploring these themes without actually having to go through with it, but this book implies that we could be seeing those themes explored literally in the future of the series. And if not that, I feel like the book at least will be there to explore and develop Kokoro's motherly disposition that we've seen her have. In fact, on the topic of this book, there are some that even speculate that Dr. Franks sent them to this beach for the sole intention of them finding this city and eventually finding a book or something to that effect that teaches them what love is, what children are, etc, etc. And this would fit right in line with Dr. Franks's character since we know he has a distaste for APE headquarters and might want the group to know something that APE isn't letting them know. Let's move on to the next character seed and that is Ikuno and her feelings for Ichigo. It can no longer be denied, I hope you all realize that after this episode, the way that Ikuno talks to Ichigo on the beach, how happy she is, how she remembers certain things about Ichigo like her being good at swimming, and the way that her demeanor changes as soon as Ichigo leaves and she starts talking to Mitsuru. It's just so obvious. And even later on in the forest, when Ikuno brushes Ichigo's hair out of her face and is worried about her face being all red, it's clear as day and I cannot wait to see what they do with this relationship as well. There are so many plot threads being set up that they will have to follow through with eventually and when they do, it's just going to be so interesting. And fitting right in line with that, let's move on to the next character thread, Goro and Ichigo. Again, more than enough proof is provided throughout this episode that there is something more going on between Goro and Ichigo. Now the obvious one is of course Goro being flustered at seeing Ichigo in a swimsuit. As soon as I saw that, I was like, oh my god, it's happening. But I know that there would be some people dismissing this, saying that this could just be Goro's attraction to women in general showing, but I think what really showed cases how Goro feels about Ichigo is later on in the forest when he's talking to Hiro being confused on what love and kissing is. He starts questioning if there is a relationship that two people can share that is closer than a partner and he says making your heart race. He has fun being with her but it also hurts sometimes too and of course due to the nature of all of these pilots he doesn't understand what's going on in his heart but it's clear what he's feeling is love. Something that makes you as happy as it does sad at times. I feel like this is more than enough proof to confirm their relationship and how Goro feels about her, but now I want to focus on Ichigo specifically. For one, and just an interesting note here, I think this is the only time that Ichigo is ever narrated in an episode, and for that matter, the first time that anyone outside of Hiro has narrated an episode. What this means, I don't know, but it is worth noting. It seems like to a certain extent, Ichigo has accepted Zero Two piloting with Hiro, and I think that just comes down to how much happier he is now compared to before. It shows that Ichigo values Hiro's happiness over her own. But at the same time, since the concept of love is lost on her like all of the others, she also wants the attention that Hiro gives to Zero too. I don't think she understands the concept of monogamy, as she's about to say that she wants to be with him forever before Hiro cuts her off. And also that she doesn't see the kiss from episode 2 as something to be ashamed of, but actually something that's special to her. It will be interesting to see if they go the harem route with that, I doubt it, but it is kind of refreshing to see that, while like she says, she has misgivings towards Zero Two, I don't know if she necessarily sees her as a rival. And I just want to talk about the direction in this final scene where they're walking on the beach. God, I love it so much. I love when they're walking on separate paths and Ichigo is just behind him and literally starts walking in his own footsteps. Very sweet, such a nice little detail that another studio likely wouldn't have put there. And later on, even more so when the waves eventually wash away the footsteps, maybe symbolizing that her and Hiro's relationship is not meant to be. Now let's get into the world building, and this is where we start getting into the really interesting stuff. I want to begin with an interesting line from Dr. Franks that we see in a flashback before this beach episode occurred from the aftermath from the last episode. We see him warn Hiro when Zero Two is not around, telling him, don't let her consume your emotions if you want to always be her partner, otherwise you'll be the one to suffer later. What is this alluding to, man? I was like, 
What? Is he telling Hiro not to fall in love with Zero Two because she'll do something to him or something will happen to her? This is a piece of mystery that I probably have the least to say about and speculate on just because I have no idea what this could allude to. This is likely some end game shit right here that will be a major revelation when it occurs. We get a tiny scene of APE headquarters yet again where they give us some fascinating fascinating world building, entirely new plot concepts that we were not aware of until now. For one, Hiro is referred to as a failure of a special specimen. What is going on with this dude? Is Hiro a unique kind of experiment done within the Franks program that ended up not working out? This was always questioned and even speculated on in the first episode where Naomi was forced to leave and yet Hiro was allowed to stay. And now we know the nature and reason for that. Hiro was clearly something that was supposed to be special to the Franks program and to APE but winded up failing. As APE also say, I wish that he had shown us this from the start. I think that this could also tie into the nines directly. Maybe Hero was even supposed to be a nine, I don't know. But we do get a brief interaction between the leader, assumedly the leader, and Hero in this flashback. And while he didn't acknowledge Hero on a familiar basis, in fact, he even says, I always wanted to see you up close, uh, implying that he hadn't already, there was a lot of speculation last week about what he he says at the end, Nine Iota. And I did my best to search up what that meant and what that could mean for him and his connection with Hero and Zero Two, but something I did not learn that you guys told me about was that Iota is actually the Greek numeral for 10. So to say Nine Iota would be to say 910. Flip that number upside down and it's 016, Hero's code number. A lot of you attributed this to mean that he was referring to Hero last week's episode not zero two. It could be considered a stretch, but it is definitely worth noting. I just find it interesting how in this episode, he refers to zero two as zero two and hero as zero 016. But what I find even more interesting about this Yoda comment, more interesting than the 910 flipped upside down, is that last week after I looked it up, I told you guys that Yoda actually means the ninth star in a constellation. And in this episode, we see that hero actually got Ichigo's name from the constellation Orion, where the 15th star is named Ichigo. The similarities between these two situations and that common theme of a constellation being where he got the name, it's just uncanny. It means something, I swear it does. During the same APE headquarters meeting, what's weird is when they refer to Zero Two's goal of finding a man, they comment on it being silly, indicating that they find it ultimately pointless. Originally, I thought it was a goal that they had also wanted Zero Two to accomplish, but it's here we learn, no, it's kind of just Zero Two doing her own thing. They don't care. At the same time though, it's now that she has Hero with her that we see them beginning or enacting this plan that they've had ready for a while now. And this is where we get into the insane stuff. Hero is now tasked with bringing Zero Two to the Grand Crevice. I love that they name drop something so huge that we have no idea about. All I can do is speculate right now and I think I have a good idea of what they're referring to. I feel like the Grand Crevice is what they call the origin point of the Klaxosaurs. This is also probably what they refer to as the front lines where all of the Klaxosaurs originate. Grand Crevice would also indicate a giant split in the earth, which like I mentioned last week, is likely where the Klaxosaurs came from in the first place, so everything adds up. I'm gonna assume that this is the origin point and our main purpose for the foreseeable future of the series. The question is, why do we need to take Zero Two to this point in the first place? Are we going going on a Mount Doom journey, Lord of the Rings style, to somehow stop the Klaxosaurs once and for all. And how does this have to do with Zero Two? I mean, of course it's her Klaxosaur blood, but why does she have the power to stop this? On the nature of Zero Two and her position, we now learn that she is one of APE's special forces, most likely also a title given to the Nines. And of course, this could probably be implied from what we've learned so far. She is special to APE, she's incredibly talented, she's a single digit, but what we couldn't imply before is what the nature of these special forces were. And it's here that we learn that a special forces unit belonging exclusively to one plantation is very rare. Plantation 13 is now 
under special surveillance because a special forces number, in this case 02, belongs exclusively to them now. So what we can gather from this is that the special forces are sent as needed to various plantations and slash or kept to protect APE headquarters itself. But it's only during the campfire scene near the end of the episode where probably the most pivotal question that has been posed to us in the series so far is asked. Hero starts wondering about the nature of Papa and the adults and wonders if humans never started extracting magma, would the Klaxosaurs have ever shown up? The answer to this seems obvious and of course we discussed this in last week's review, but assuming this is the case, was there more to extracting magma than just simply harvesting an energy efficient fuel? Is there something more going on here behind the scenes? And if there is, what is the purpose of creating these mobile bases instead of much stronger and founded stationary ones in the outside world? I feel like these questions will be driving the overarching narrative as we uncover more about the adults and Papa, and that's one of the things I'm loving most about this series is just that sense of mystery and intrigue. It's in this conversation that Zerome also confirms something that we have all been suspecting for a while now. Children are the only ones piloting to protect Papa and the adults' lifestyle, and they have no issue with it. Zerome is actually proud to be protecting their lifestyle, putting his life on the line in hopes of becoming an adult one day himself. But again, as we saw in episode 5, there is something more going on with the adults and becoming an adult might not be as simple as just becoming an adult. I like in this scene that the group is also trying to be more open and inclusive to Zero Two. We have finally reached the point where they consider her a part of their group as well, even Ichigo, but it's here that we see that she still separates herself from them, including Hiro, and this does speak a lot to her personality and maybe even her disposition to the group from here on out. I just wonder if she'll ever reach the point where she feels comfortable within this group as a part of the team. And finally, I initially had a problem with the boys being head over over heels for the girls in their swimsuits because it was like, okay, you guys care about this, but you don't care when their asses are in your face during piloting. But Zerome's line that the girls for some reason look 50% cuter and it's a mystery why they do was enough to be like, oh, okay, at least they're acknowledging that they don't know why. It's still a bit off, especially when later on in the episode they question what a kiss is and Zerome has no issue kissing Hiro. Let the Yowie ship sail. But I can forgive it, it's an anime thing, it's entertaining enough, and it doesn't really take me out of the situation that they're in. And before I close this review out, I just have to say this new ED is fire. It's so good, but unfortunately, it will likely be gone after this episode. I applaud the studio for developing a completely original ED for this one beach episode. They could theoretically use the same song with different imagery, but I think we'll just be going back to the normal ED after this. It is a shame though, because I love this song a lot. But that has been all from me for this episode review of Darling in the Franks. Thank you all so much for watching. As always, I really appreciate your likes, comments, support. I am very sorry about last week's episode review being so late to reply to so many of your comments. I am just so swamped with things I'm doing in my personal life right now. And it doesn't help that I released like three videos consecutively last week. So there were so many comments to reply everywhere. I'm still trying to reply to some comments. Just know that I do read every single comment that is posted on the videos and I always try to find the time to reply to everybody when I can because you guys offer really valuable insight to me and of course as usual have a great day